Could you explain Chicago, Chicago Chinatown's growth and success? Um, for example, what has contributed to its growth as opposed to other Chinatowns in the U.S.? So we keep talking about it. Chicago's Chinatown is the only one in the U.S. to continue to see growth. What crosses your mind when you step through the borders of Chicago's Chinatown? Some might associate Chinatown as a grand excursion full of sights, exotic experiences, and wonders. Others might relish the idea of sinking their teeth into the sweet flaky pastry buns of their local bakeries. But Chinatown isn't just a tourist destination. It is a place that many call home. Chicago's Chinatown was a physical frontier formed and confined by the obstacles of discrimination, segregation, and racism. Yet the Chinese of Chicago did not passively accept such conditions in which they were compelled to live. Through political advocacy, economic developments, communal engagement, beautification projects, and anchor institutions, Chicago's Chinatown has crossed physical and discriminatory frontiers to transform into an integrative and prosperous modern-day ethnic enclave. So how do we get from what used to be a slum of Chicago to a culturally rich, modern-day ethnic enclave? Well, let's go back in time. During the Great California Gold Rush of 1849, an influx of Chinese immigrated to the United States in an effort to escape the economic devastation of the floods, droughts, and opium wars in China. In 1863, the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad provided further opportunities to hire Chinese immigrants. They were willing to work hard for less pay. Soon, conflicts about the competition for housing and job availabilities brought up discriminatory accusations against the Chinese. This led to the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. As the first and only U.S. federal law to discriminate against a specific ethnic group, it barred both skilled and unskilled laborers and Chinese employed in mining from entering the country for 10 years. California passed more restrictive laws driving many Chinese immigrants to cross physical frontiers eastward to cities like New York, Boston, and Chicago. You know, the original Chicago Chinatown was at Clark and Van Buren, which is, is part of the loop, which is Chicago's downtown. In the early 1900s, actually 1912, uh, the whole community just picked up and left. The extension of the Chinese Exclusion Act was made indefinite in 1902, sparking the Chinese government to boycott all American-made goods in 1905. But this boycott backfired for those living in Chicago's Chinatown, as the white landlords and tenants doubled and even tripled their rent and living costs. Such political clout and racial discrimination forced the Chinese to settle down to another frontier along Wentworth Avenue and Cermak Road, an area considered to be the slums of Chicago. This area today became what is now known as the New Chinatown. As high crime rates, violence, and racial discrimination increased, Chinatown's living conditions worsened. In an effort to solve these issues, the Chinese formed tight-knit associations, or Tongs, with the intention to protect members and help them in sickness and poverty, to assist them to become familiar with the laws and customs of their adopted country, and yet not forget their fatherland, language, and family codes. We have the uh, Ondang Center, which is today called Pui Tech Center. That was a so-called city hall. In those days, they settled disputes between uh, businesses. If there's, you know, if you want to open up a hand laundry, you can't do it next to each other. So they maintain, uh, you know, some peace and decorum. When the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943, many Chinese immigrants flooded into the Chinatown area, resulting in overcrowding. This soon led to another need for the Chinese to cross the borders, moving past 26th Street and into the Bridgeport and Armour Square areas. But with the Italian community already living in this area, this only caused more racial tension between the two. And there's a lot of discrimination in those days. You cannot, if in those days, when I came to Chicago, mm -hmm. I think in 1969, all you can live is Cermak, 22nd Street, and Alexander. You cannot pass 21st Street. If you pass 23rd, 24th, 25th, you will get beat up by the Italians. To build a sense of connectivity within the community, the Chinese erected the Chinatown Gateway in 1975 with the hand-painted Chinese characters, the world belongs to the commonwealth. It's a statement that reflects the spirit and determination of the Chinese people. 
Although several Chinatowns across America have many worthy developments in their communities, this begs us to answer the question, why is Chicago's Chinatown the only flourishing Chinatown in the U.S.? It is because of its ability to resist the threats of gentrification while still growing in its Asian population. This is unlike any other Chinatown in the U.S. For example, San Francisco's local residents struggle to keep up with housing affordability to this day. Or in Manhattan, where a 2020 census showed there was a 10% decrease in the Asian population. In 2016, a $7 billion project called the 78 was proposed to construct a single road or river walk that would unite all 77 neighborhoods in Chicago. Today we're talking about another big program called the 78, Chicago's Next Great Neighborhood. This development will unite them all as a 78th one, providing newly developed hotels, tourist attractions, parks, and highly convenient highway access. But Chinatown residents express concerns about affordable housing, property taxes, traffic and transportation, among other issues. Some participants talked about how a mega development with chain restaurants and shops could push out local businesses and residents. I think development is always a tug of war. It's always a conflict between wanting to have better amenities and wanting to keep things affordable. So what has Chicago's Chinatown done to prevent gentrification? That's where political advocacy comes in. When Illinois state legislative boundaries were being remapped in 2011, political advocates lobbied together for a single Asian representative state district. So it's been important for the constituents to have an Asian um, American representing them in Springfield because that's where the decisions are made. You know, we pass legislation that become policy you know, affecting 13 million people across the state, but for the population here, you know, the folks that I represent, you know, they need someone who's very attentive as to their situations, you know, their experiences. Unless the person representing them understands exactly what people need, it's hard to fight for, um, for those needs and to get all the resources that, that you know, they deserve. For two census cycles, the community tried to push for the consolidation of the wards with little success. We're nearly 7% of the population in Chicago, and we don't have a single majority Asian American ward in the city. I think it's, you know, time now to create that ward. The census 2020 numbers show that it is possible to create a majority Asian American ward. These advocates and anchor institutions fought harder because they believed this would lead to better representation, greater civic engagement among Asian voters, and an Asian in the city council. Such persistence helped to form Chicago's first Asian American majority ward and the appointment of Nicole Lee, the first Chinese American woman in Chicago, as alderman of the 11th ward in 2022. Many deemed this as another step towards preserving Chinatown's rich culture in itself. The fact that I'm able to represent the Asian American community and everybody that lives in the 11th ward, it's a very diverse ward, um, is really powerful, I think. I, you know, as I talk to young people, um, young and old actually, uh, and of all races, it's time that this community had a representative that, that uh, reflected the community. These anchor institutions have also worked to ensure better safety within the Chinatown community. This is because the people and volunteers have a vested interest and live within the area. They aren't merely volunteers who come to visit, volunteer, and then leave. You can't really get a feel for the city and, and truly know it unless you're in it. It just unlocks a different kind of care um, and it breaks your heart in a different way when you're walking the same streets, when you're going to sleep in the same place that, that you know our people are sleeping in, and you're going through some of the same safety concerns. So it really wakes you up in a way that you can't um, just reading about it or thinking about it. You have to experience it. Chicago's Chinatown is a cultural identity and heritage marker that has flourished more than any other Chinatown in the U.S., and here's why. Whenever you cross through this expansive integrated frontier, you'll see that it has developed over time, socially, culturally, and geographically. Because the Chinese of Chicago have understood the value of civic engagement and community support, they've stepped out from silence and passivity and gained a powerful voice as political advocates. Whether erecting beautification projects, investing in economic developments, or forming the first Asian American majority ward, Chicago's Chinatown continues to cross physical and discriminatory frontiers to transform into an integrative and prosperous community. Chicago Chinatown hopes to pass on the legacy of preserving its cultures, values, and traditions for generations to come. From survivalist roots as a haven escaping California's anti-Chinese laws, to establishing the most flourishing Chinatown, the Chinese cross frontiers with resolve and resilience to make a thriving community.